Usually people call me Aliluz. I'm Latina, disabled, and I work in STEM. Um, and I'm an academic research, uh, researcher and um, PhD student in the computer science, uh, the School of Computer Science. Um, as a member of the AD committee uh, in the Gaines Institute, I have been working with the members and our chair, Gerald, uh, to continually make space for marginalized communities. Um, I truly believe that setting them up for success and ensuring that they have a seat at the table in the academic and gaming communities is the only way uh, to better our progress as a group, individuals, and to positively impact our society. This includes, but is not limited to people who identify as disabled, uh, women, LGBTQ+, and indigenous. While I am an immigrant who is settled in North York, um, I acknowledge that I live in land that belongs to indigenous peoples. Um, I recognize that my lack of depth and knowledge on these specific peoples who occupy where I'm living. And um, I have got to know a little bit of the information, but I am not going to sit in a high horse here and pretend that I know everything about it. Um, what I know is that the city of Toronto is on the traditional territory of many, many nations, um, including the uh, Mississaugas of the Credit, uh, the Ashnabag, and the Chippewa, and the uh, Haude Nosane. Sorry if I said it wrong, um, and the Uendat people. Um, and now it's home to many diverse First Nations, uh, both Inuit and Metis people. Whilst the University of Waterloo, where I work, um, is situated in the Haldimand Trek, um, the traditional um, territory of the neutral Ashnabeg and Haldanese peoples too. Um, it's clear that my place of work and home is a benefit from the continued land dispossession of indigenous peoples and the assimilation steps taken during the time of settlement and confederation up to nowadays. So this is one of the things that definitely we want to ensure that we are making space uh, for people and um, giving them the opportunity to um, um, get a seat at the table. So what is this event? This is the ADA uh, speaker series. Um, and this uh, event is part of the ADA for Game Communities and Culturing anti-racism, decolonization, uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, in games of search and creation. Um, and this is a series from our committee uh, with the Games Institute um, and the University of Waterloo, and it's, it's supported in part by funding from uh, the Social Sciences and Humanities uh, Research Council. Uh, so for those of you who are not very familiar with the GI uh, or the Games Institute, we will call GI more often than not. Uh, this is a research institute at the University of Waterloo that is home to interdisciplinary researchers who seek to advance study, design, and purpose um, of interactive and immersive technologies and experiences. Um, our research, of course, includes game like the one that we're going to discuss today, but it also includes interactive and immersive media at large. Um, we endeavor to be a place where researchers from all backgrounds can come together, learn from each other beyond the boundaries of each one of their disciplines. So um, if you don't work straight up in the middle of games, don't worry about it. You're welcome here and all knowledge is uh, is better, um, makes us better, regardless of what you do. Um, now let's talk about Kata. Um, Dr. Kata Spiel, um, she is a Hertha Finberg Scholar at the HCI Group of uh, TU Wien, Vienna University of Technology. You can feel free to correct me, Kata. Um, where they work on the intersection of computer science, design, and cultural studies. Kata uh, researches marginalized perspectives on uh, technologies to inform interaction design, 
and engineering in critical ways, so they may account uh, for the diverse realities that they operate in. Um, drawing uh, on methods from critical participatory design, which is so cool, um, and action research on a background heavily shaped by queer theories and disability stu studies, which is so important. Um, they collaborate with neurodivergent people like me. <laughs> I am neurodivergent as well. Uh, and non-binary peers uh, in conducting um, explorations of novel potentials for designs, methodological contributions to human-computer interaction, and innovative technological artifacts. So uh, now let's uh, get into what Tata has to tell us and be marveled by their work. Okay, I understand. Ich muss es hier in Lautsprache machen, weil sonst ähm, versteht mich niemand. Ah, ah, sie schauen immer noch so. Ah, I get it. You need it in English language. So I assume none of you speak any kind of sign language. Also, this was Austrian sign, so it doesn't make a lot of sense. Thank you again for um, presenting me. That's one of the things I said. Um, I wanted you to uh, uh, have an experience there, and that is an experience of access. So what you experienced a little bit, and you also get the slides now, because um, now they make actually sense. I just wanted to make sure the signing is visible in case it was relevant to someone. Give me a second. So uh, the point there was um, for you to experience what, what access could mean. Um, so first, uh, I uh, used a mode that uh, I assumed most of you were not really familiar with. Uh, it's a visual language, in that case, Austrian Sign Language, which, by the way, is different than the German one, in case anybody uh, wanted to know. Um, then I started it in German, uh, which is a modality, at least, that most hearing people here might be used to, like hearing a voice, but also might have used a little bit of a kind of like, you know, what is happening here? I don't understand what's going on. And when I switched to English, you probably had a moment that I call as an experience of access. Suddenly, things made sense. It was not kind of like difficult to figure out what the situation was, what was happening. You got afforded access. Some of you might speak German. For you, this was happening a little earlier. Um, but uh, what I try to make the point there is that access is afforded in, in many cases most of uh, to most of you in ways that you are not necessarily aware of. And it is like for the remainder of this talk also afforded to you in the English language, just so you know. But, um, but I, I, I just want to point out that it is not always afforded to my disabled peers and myself, and that is why I do work in this area. And I think this is also important for games, and this is why we're talking about where is the fun in doing that, because I ask that question a lot, and you will see why. But first, hello, I'm Katja Spiel. My pronouns are they, them. I am a white non-binary person with giant green glasses and short graying hair that is um, dark brown otherwise. Um, I'm wearing a dark gray sweater. I talked to you from Vienna, which, you know, um, has more of a colonizing history than one of one being colonized. But I do want to acknowledge that it is part of the European Union, which means um, that there is a lot of border control happening that is enforced by Frontex, that is violent towards um, people who want to migrate to Europe. So there is an effectively violent way of keeping people out that we operate, that we exploit to keep our wealth here. Um, so I will be uh, talking a bit about my ongoing work where I try to think about bodies and interaction and in play in a way that includes disabled bodies on a theoretical level and, and on a practical level, because I have the impression and, and, the, and that impression is like from my research, um, but I have noticed that it often lacks um, kind of like a consideration at the very basic front. But first, think about how are you right now? Like you have a body. Um, it always seems like a bit of a of a confusing statement. Oh, I forgot to say I'm neurodivergent, which is, by the way, a neurodivergent mode to come like back on that later. But, you know, back to this. Um, how are you? You have a body. It behaves in certain ways. It has specific needs. Some of them might be met right now. Some of them might not be. Um, 
you uh, uh, might just like need a drink or something or um, realize now that you know you kind of like want to get it up and like walk around that's all fine I don't care what you do honestly uh, I assume that you listen in ways that are comfortable to you uh, I had three student meetings today during all of which I was building Lego my students are used to that I am also very used to that that, that sometimes people need to do things and you're free to follow the needs that you have. I am, by the way, not a core games researcher, at least that's not my kind of identity, despite the name, because Spiel means play or games, uh, not lost the irony on that, uh, but I use games and I use playful, or thinking through playful things to come to a point or, or like as a, as a, you know, theoretical artifact. So I would argue, I know that play is not always fun, but it is kind of fun. We all love doing it in like many kind of like ways. There are consoles, like different kinds of consoles and tangibles and objects and augmented environments. Daniel and I just talked about VR and like so many games. What are your favorite games? Like you can share some and like, you know, then we all have a list as well. Um, there are generally many definitions on play. But, you know, overall, I try to understand it as a self-guided personal interest activity that is, you know, often self-determined, which is also why a lot of games researchers, at least in HCI, come to turn to self-determination theory when they try to look at how people enjoy their games. But when it comes to disabled populations, I have noticed the thing. I've looked at it uh, specifically in the context of games and neurodivergence and so, um, uh, together with Katrin Gerling, and what we found is, I quote, playfulness as an enjoyable, self-determined, voluntary, fun, and essentially unproductive concept is largely absent for neurodivergent players. Instead, the rhetorical concept of fun and games is exploited for the sake of othering neurodivergent populations further to, quote unquote, cure them, to, quote unquote, identify them, through diagnosis, to imply that their sociality and knowledge is insufficient, and to use notions of inclusion while pointedly conceptualizing neurodivergent as deviant from neurotypical norms. This comes with fundamental consequences, communicating to neurodivergent people at large, including neurodivergent researchers as peers, and research in this space needs to be careful not to fall into a trap where our existence is undesirable or is rendered as undesirable and abnormal. Which, you know, I can say that more easy. Essentially, why do all the games for neurodivergent people suck, at least in how they are conceptualized as explicitly for neurodivergent people? Not all of them, but there was like, you know, 10% or so maybe, uh, who, who might not have, you know, had that impetus of using games and play as a rhetoric to, um, essentially serve some kind of like external or extrinsic motivation goal, um, which, you know, doesn't go a lot with self-determination. And for a field that is obsessed with self-determination theory, I was wondering how that didn't help understand any of that. Um, that just as a quip. But ultimately, I was wondering, why does everybody get to have fun? games for fun or enjoyment or leisure or kind of like, you know, as an activity they'd like to do, why do neurodivergent people then have to do games? Like, why is it, why is that rhetoric or that format used to kind of like put in a forced type of interaction? Because it's not nice. So I was trying to figure out more. So from that, I was also trying to figure out what makes play actually interesting and you know, where are bodies in play? Um, and I understand, by the way, I understand bodily difference as, as holistic, like in the concept of a body-mind strategy. So I don't see mental or physical disabilities as kind of like a difference. I just like understand them all as different embodiments in the world out there, which is why I'm gonna just talk about bodies. All right, so. Because play is ultimately always very embodied, because as I said earlier, you have a body. So everything you do is ultimately embodied. It's not like you know, rocket science. Though I did rocket science once um, in during my master's, and it's also it turns out to not be rocket science. It was interesting. Anyway, so Katrin Gerling again and I used the surrogate body theory to understand this a bit better. 
Um, and so methodologically, we also use the kind of visual analysis to try and figure out where are bodies in play, um, where do they, where are they positioned, how close are they to the artifact, what is happening, what what is kind of like you know the specific aspect, where how they are they positioned in kind of different dispositives, so kind of like circumstances, if you may, um, and just trying to to understand a bit more about the the different qualities uh, and how bodies are kind of like contorted and and positioned within play. And so we use the surrogate body theory, which comes from media studies, particularly film studies, and developed it has been developed by Christiane Foss, who has been one of my teachers at the Bauhaus University. Um, distilled into one sentence, that theory says that immersion happens when a viewer lends their affective, and that means also emotional, responses to a film by embodying them by embodying those emotions, and that leads to a metaphorical body that is made up between the intersubjective interplay between viewers and film, and then facilitated through physical and aesthetic distancing. That sounds a bit complex, but because I tried to understand it, I literally went to a drawing board and tried to figure out what this might mean. So where is that surrogate body? It's not literally drawn there, but I, I, I tried to kind of like get to the other aspects too. What do people do? And as you can see here, the cinematic dispositive means that people don't do a lot. The effective response can be outward or not, but the screen is also quite far away and you kind of like have to bridge a large physical distance, so to speak, with the embodied reactions are fairly limited by the physical constraints of just the chairs and the seating options and some of the social expectations. Like, I had a seven-year-old ask me very loudly what just happened when someone died. Can imagine, like, that's what I mean with, like, social expectations. Or, like, you know, when you when you comment along, that is also usually not positively re uh, received. Um, and so there are limits to what you can do. You have to be quiet, at least in Austria. Maybe it's not that much where you are right now. So I love the theory a bit. Like, I, I think it explains a lot about how it's important that we kind of like, and how we in, in, in have, to have that embodied response that is um, affective, that is emotional, but how that is embodied as well, and how, how there is kind of like a stepping into a specific kind of body and that creates immersion. It's much more complex than that, but I also don't have unlimited time. Um, encourage you to look it up. Uh, but ultimately, I've also been angry for a few years. Because there is a one particular footnote in the book, and I can hold a grudge if I want to, but like Foss claims that games and digital media are essentially equivalent to cinematic dispositives. And I was like, that's not true. And then I even argued with her. <laughs> and then I, you know, six years later wrote a paper. Um, but let's uh, let's talk about how that looks like. Why is that different? So this is a fairly you know classic kind of like stereo, almost stereotypical gamer image, where um, someone is at a personal computer setup, and no Kaylee is there, so that's curiously, um, just FYI, context. We still have um, a screen here, multiple in fact, but suddenly we also have a surrogate body that is located in two positions as players not only lend this is important effective responses but also lend their actions to the game. And given that this tends to be an at least physically somewhat solitary and private activity, emotional responses can be embodied in more expressiveness. But, you know, if you're being really expressive about it, that might have consequences for gameplay. Because, like, imagine getting real angry or, like, you know, accidentally, like, throwing your coffee cup across the keyboard or, you know, having a response that makes you jaggle your mouse or whatever, like because it is all embodied, it might have and, and there's an interlope between the emotions and the uh, and the actions you lend that one might, you know, influence the other. And that plays out differently in different scenarios, but ultimately holds across different play dispositives. When we play, we lend not just emotions, but also actions to the surrogate body, like we kind of submerge more into that. That is important because certain actions are more or less possible within certain dispositives. And that's not how we think about these. We don't necessarily think about it as like, you know, uh, um, if we if we play with that, um, for example, with the next one, if we play with that, we need to have hands. There we go. 
So Nintendo cardboard we set up. It was modern at the time. Um, so that's David, by the way, for anyone who has that knowledge. But like um, coming back to like you, you don't really um, you don't really think about like the ex exact things that people need to have or need to like the exact bodies that you imagine having to play with that. You usually um, conceptualize that more implicitly in development, as far as I have been informed. Anyway, coming back a bit to the emotions and actions. So games are a bit different from the cinema because you land actions as well. And um, it can be hugely diverse across different um, play scenarios, which we can all understand as embodied. But it just also has um, different types of bodily involvement. Like in this case, you do have more, more kind of like constrained actions at the same time um, in in, that they are like, you know, more mapped to a specific meaning. So then when you are at the keyboard, the same kind of like movement can mean different things, whereas there, that kind of movement of fishing is only related to the fishing. That's what I mean with like constraint meanings in the actions. So yeah. So bringing the surrogate body theory into play doesn't just mean that we're able to extend that theory, but it also helps us understand more of how bodies play, I think. And there are lots of bodies playing, and we understand bodies in different play contexts and what that might mean more and more, but we struggle to account a bit for that in design. And it's not just a matter of representation, although, you know, that is also important, and we've realized that more and more in the last few years. Just want to, like, you know, give like little shout outs to Kishona Gray and Kale Passmore and Sabina Hara and Bo Ruberg uh, and many, many others who are really, uh, also Gerald and like, you know, <laughs> there are so many people working on that as well. Um, but I think it's not the only thing that we need to look at. And there is like many, look, show how the hegemony of play, um, uh, what, what it entails and that games are played by diverse groups of people and they should represent diverse groups of people and address the various types of rea lived realities. But that's not necessarily what I do here. But there is some kind of issues like with the ultimate technological premises as well, because most technological design and development is underpinned by ableist assumptions that lead to the design of inaccessible technology. Um, Jenny and I briefly talked, but um, I have observed deaf people uh, using VR and in VR, for example, and that's not even in any of our papers, but like in VR, you have kind of this thing where you expect that people can communicate with their environment through hearing and speech with their immediate environment. And deaf people do a lot of this, like up and down, up and down, up and down. Well, not great for immersion. So I do wonder what it would look like to design it from a particularly deaf point of view. Um, and I'm hearing, so. I'm not the best person to do that, but we'll see. But that's what I mean. Like there are inherently ableist assumptions that lead to the design of inaccessible technology. And how can we reimagine games or the kind of like dispositives that shape them as a technolo technology or kind of like a technological setup that accommodates bodily diversity? And I think we need to recognize that both within research and industry, we still engage in the creation of disabling and exclusive body-based technologies. And then later we make kind of like that additional effort to patch up a persistent oversight, which, you know, is also like from a money point of view, if you want to engage with that, probably more expensive to do. Um, it's not my point of view, like no, my main point, but um, it's, it's also like in, you know, exhausting for everyone who kind of like wants to engage, for example, with VR and then realizes, you know, very different experience. So this suggests that there is a general need to move from a paradigm of kind of like improving for or making accessible for or um, or like kind of like patching that to a perspective of creating with even like not just accounting for the diversity of bodies from the very start of the system development, but also placing duty for engaging in this process with the stakeholders who seek to reap the benefits of the systems they design. Because too often we, as, as you know, those people who also shape these technologies and kind of like, I know that not everyone at the Games Institute does that, but I'm speaking to kind of like the disciplinary niche that I kind of like operate within. 
which is human computer interaction. Um, and then too often we act as though we are a bit surprised by the inaccessibility of technology. Well, perhaps we should have been able to draw this conclusion at the very beginning of the design process. And partly this is because we don't understand what a fundamental experience, like how, how access fundamentally shapes the experiences that we make with technologies or that we can make with technologies. And also how that depends on not just like access as such, but also different types of access. So the important thing is kind of like, we don't understand how access is facilitated, but, um, but it is so paramount to having specific types of experiences with games and like, may they be positive or negative, then comes like at a second point that is later, but like we, we first have, but how we gain access to those also shapes what kind of things we might have and bodies play a huge role in that diversity in how that access is shaped. So whether a game is frustrating and a positive and kind of like, you know, failure is engaged with as a positive aspect of kind of experience um, draws on like, you know, being forced to fail or, you know, getting something out of it. So for example, there are games and this is very personal, but like there are games where I just like, you know, I'm, I'm giving up because I notice that I have to do this one kind of um, series of movements uh, and uh, in like a certain type of speed or rhythm. And I just don't have the kind of, uh, I just don't get it done or whatever. And like it, try half an hour and then that is not joyful for me. And then there are games where I'm like, you know, Isaac, if you still know that, um, not necessarily a politically very correct game, but um, no, but like you know, you have these dungeon crawlers where where you where you know you have to get through, and you kind of like also the game supports you more and more, and it's like clear that you will be able like to at some point just by the buffs you get and all that have an easier time going through, and that is much more enjoyable as a failure. Um, but the point is, like, you know, both of those are inaccessible. Like, in both cases, you don't get directly towards that kind of, like, you know, experience of achievement, but one feels much more accessible, and that kind of, like, shapes the positive experience of failing versus the negative experience of failing, where it feels like there is no way to get around that other than that one specific movement that you might not be able to do. And, and part of that is also because there is this kind of um, corporal standard. So we have an expected expected actions in a game that end up also communicating that. So it's kind of like when you're expected to, um, to perform these very fast, for example, very fast specific kind of like button presses, you expect that somebody does not have a tremor or has like full hand control but you're not explicitly sitting there designing like somebody needs to have like, you know, that kind of hand control It's kind of implicit, but it's still communicating a standard, especially to those who um, have found themselves never kind of meeting the implicitly communicated standards. There are different models of disability. Are you all aware of different types of models of disability? No, tell us. <laughs> so good. <laughs> well, thanks. I wasn't sure, like, because I also don't want to bore you, and that is easily done. But, like, essentially, you can understand disability in different terms, and one of them is being, like, as a medical difference that needs to be corrected, which is how you end up with a lot of games that try to either diagnose people or kind of, like, ther be used in therapy and, um, and all these other kinds of things uh, uh, to be, you know, not actually for play but like for this other type of view you can also have that with a so-called social model where you're like okay there's like disabling experiences from the outside and that's how you end up with a lot of games that kind of assume that you know neurodivergent people need to be taught specific social skills without questioning what those social skills are and for whom um yeah not a huge fan and i kind of like there are more than three models of disability by the way but like i this is to simplify this a bit but I kind of like operate from a model of like um, that is kind of identity and self-determined, identity based and self-determined where you kind of take up a disabled identity and um, like that is like 
not completely independent from a bodily status, but like it kind of like assumes um, that there is a way of engaging with a world through bodily difference that acknowledges the difference as a difference, but not as a deviant difference and acknowledges the role that social environments have to play with it, but more from kind of like, you know, a rights-based perspective, for example. But not, that doesn't just mean um, legal context, but also kind of like, you know, how you interact with your immediate environment and, and what kind of interactions you expect or want to have. Anyway, um, the corporal standard kind of like is more in the in the in the first one in that kind of medical model where it's um, because you're being thrown back as a disabled person constantly to that notion of like you cannot lend your actions and you cannot lend your emotions um, because the game is just like not prepared to take them from you and like you know not interested in in, in engaging with those that sucks and you know again if we come back to the money model there are probably lots of people who kind of I don't know buy a game and then realize ultimately that they can't play it and so for the publisher it doesn't matter but i think it matters in terms of like how how we share these really meaningful experiences among each other and how we can relate to them together and so this is why i'm not in love with money arguments so because i am more interested in principles of access and disability justice and play so specifically, I then encourage developers mostly, but also I think us as researchers, because the question, I mean, I also know that to some extent I'm preaching to a choir here, but like this, this whole thinking leads me to the point where we need to start not understanding disability as something that is just like other and different, but something that, you know, has, um, has in and of itself comes with like unique lived experiences and unique types of knowledges and and very intricate ways of cultural comings together where where we you know different things are prioritized and and um and they might even be a source of playful experiences i still dream of a game where it is actually really really beneficial of you where you um if you can uh if you don't have the capacity to regulate your emotion, uh, not your emotion, your um, your attention necessarily, where, where you're kind of like encouraged to switch a lot, for example, and like that will make it easier or more fun for, and there are these games out there, but they're not like, we're not investigating them as such. We're not looking at what makes a game fun for a neurodivergent person. We're looking at a bit like more like, how how can we, you know, Find out whether they're neurodivergent, which is not the same. Um, yeah, uh, there was a question regarding the neurodiversity model. I just saw that. The neurodiversity model would follow. So, hmm, back. so you can apply the kind of like medical, social mo and identity model kind of also on neurodivergence. So you have an assessment of, you know, neurodivergent um, existences as deficient or, you know, you could say it's a social environment where um, where there are certain expectations that aren't met or certain um, where there are um, social standards that are not uh, um, conducive to uh, neurodivergent sociality. Um, and you can have a neurodiversity model, which is similar to kind of like what I would like just in, in general define as that kind of um, identity based self determined model, which is kind of the new called the neurodiversity model. And that assumes that, you know, we just all have different brains and it's fine. <laughs> this was very short, but like essentially that there are different neurologies um, and types of neurologies present and we need all of them, just like the biodiversity that we need, like we need different kinds of plants and animals to live together. We also, as humanity, might need different types of neurologies and like ways of thinking to, you know, help combat climate change, I guess, because that's the big survival question. I also want to pray, uh, want to encourage people to prioritize access to play um, and like to play experiences because also you don't like, like just start thinking about like who has access to play. It doesn't even have to be that everybody at all the time has access to everything. But I think we need to start thinking about what access entails and who access is provided for. 
Again, most of this talk was given in English, so whoever understands the English language in, in, it, in a um, spoken mode now had an advantage and has been provided access throughout, essentially, um, without any kind of, you know, big issue. It's just like, you know, most people experience access, who have experiences of access do so as an ordinary experience, whereas this is not afforded for disabled people. But if we think explicitly about who is who, what kinds of access are provided in games, that might help us more to understand also which exclusions take part. But like, you know, sometimes you make choices. That's fine. Like, I'm not saying everything has to be universal design. I'm more trying to say, hey, there are you always afford access to someone and better you make a choice than just like happen to always follow up a corporal standard. That is not a directed view, it's just a general view. And then I also want people to remember that it's about, you know, that self-determined kind of like, you know, fun question. There are also principles of access and disability justice that come into play there. Like, um, because as I initially said, there are experiences made by disabled people that are always the same, always and have been perpetuated by technologies that are so inflexible. I'm not sure whether you've noticed, but like they actually close options instead of opening them up. And disabled people are some of the ones who have always noticed like how somehow things were like even less possible sometimes with technology, at least on a wide rollout. No, I'm not talking about assistive technologies that are in some cases really useful and helpful. And I mean, I'm having a sensor on my body that tells me when it's time to eat, so it's good. But like, I'm not against technology. I'm just saying like, you know, when we say this is like just a general purpose technology, this is always a general purpose that kind of like indicates that some people are included and some are not. And those who are excluded make that experience of exclusion all the time. And my example is just disabled people. And so this is where disability justice comes in because you kind of have to make up for that at some point, or you could decide to make up for that, but that's the next step. First step is to understand who you include and who you exclude, but also who you provide fun for. And then, you know, you don't have to take it that serious. You can just play with that. You can play with it. Access can be fun. Think about different ways of access. This is ultimately very playful because how access is currently also, like how practices of access happen right now is all very playful and fun because you know, people have to queer things a little bit. They have to find and subvert ways of like, you know, get, gaining access to things that um, that um, are not f are often fundamentally not made for them. And there is an aspect of like fun and enjoyment in that. And you can just play and appreciate, play with that and appreciate the diversity of human bodies and challenge an inaccessible status quo. And look at what individuals needs are in play um, and like how they are independent of and very much attuned to at the same time um, to individual bodies and individual embodiment. Again, we love games, uh, otherwise we wouldn't research them or like, you know, we, I mean, okay, and maybe I'm assuming too much, but I think games are fun, at least personally, um, even when they're not. Um, I kind of need them in my daily life, but I also think that as societies, we kind of like, you know, need them and like we like playing around with things. And that's why we kind of like need to make sure that they're a bit more accessible. Um, and to think about access in games, it's less about the functional things for me, which of course are important, but they are a later step and they're a step of implementation and there are ways you can kind of like follow that up. But um, at first, we need a first step before that. We need to understand that we all have a body, and that all of our bodies are different, and that access is afforded to us in one way or another. Um, and that some of this access is like feels ordinary, but is anything but. So I encourage you just to think about your own bodies um, more explicitly and those of others to celebrate those differences and let us all play. And let us all lend our actions and emotions and not just to be, you know, identified or cured for whatever meaning of that. Anyway, since all of you were, thank you for listening. Um, and I'm very excited about your questions. You might have a lot or none at all. Hey, thank you so much, Kata. Um, so I wanted to ask the first question because we don't have any questions right now in the chat. and. 
Um, and this question is basically, it comes right after uh, what you just said. Um, so you said that play with individual embodied experiences um, is, and is important and you can make them fun. But in your perspective, what is more important to do to create an experience that includes as many people as possible that have different embodied experiences or to create an experience that caters to a specific group of people who usually don't have such wide access to games and play? So my immediate work focus more focuses more on the latter but i also like you know in general why not both you know i don't think like on a field level like i do make that personal kind of like choice because that is what interests me but i'm not saying this is more important necessarily i feel like you know all these things can can be in parallel and can you know address different issues like we want to have more shared experiences i tried to kind of like straddle that line too a little bit right where it was like we want to share experiences across different embodiments and kind of like for example when people talk about mario kart and then you know some of their friends might be kind of left left out because access might also mean just like not having had that experience because of i don't know poverty or um or parents who just didn't have any screens at home or what have you like there might be all kinds of issues there um, or not issues, but like kind of like barriers having been encountered. That is not just disability. Disability is my playing field because that is my community. But um, but but I think there are different aspects that play into that. And there are ways of like, you know, I want us to encourage to share playful experiences across different embodiments. But I also want to make sure that some sometimes people who have like you know noticed that a lot of things are not for them get things that are just for them because i remember i remember reading an old kai paper for the first time and i was like i was reviewing it and since it's a public process i think it's fine that i talk about it at least in in the abstract and like there were lots of reviewers who were like this makes no sense and the thoughts are all jumbled and it's kind of like not following the structure of an ordinary kai paper and i was like yeah, it's not written for you. It's written for me. I can like totally understand this. I follow the whole thing. The argument is logical for me. <laughs> and like, you know, it turned out it was also a neurodivergent person who wrote that. Thanks for But like, you know, um, sometimes it is really great to see like how um, even if you have access and have access to other Kai papers, right? I understand them. I can write them. It's fine. It's fine. But like, you know, Sometimes, even if you have access to the majority thing, you kind of want to have like your own cultural things. It's a bit like, you know, it's a bit of a shame that no one's here, but within the deaf community, um, there's like so much talk about including them in kind of like the dominant hearing space. But like, have you met deaf cultures? They are their own rich, vibrant environments, right? And like they, you know, in some cases, do want to be acknowledged in like what they have to provide to society, whereas, you know, and, and want to have things that are just like for them because like that is also there are disability cultures at play as well and like sometimes so and the same thing sometimes you want to share things with everyone but often those are then you know inspired by dominant things of like what people might want but there might be specific things that people might want because of their specific embodiment and that also like relates them to people like them and those are also important experiences to me both of those things are equally important but my personal interest lies in the latter Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, if anyone has any questions, feel free to raise your hand and ask any questions. The time is now. If you don't do it, I will keep asking questions. OK, uh, Mara, you can unmute yourself and ask. OK, <laughs> hello, Kata. Thank you for the presentation. Um, my question is related to um, like I'm wondering where you see rest intertwined with play um, because um, like some background to my question. Um, I'm doing my thesis on virtual reality and play. Um, so and I've been looking at um, like the differences between the kind of the loudest voices that you see in business and that kind of stuff versus um, people building virtual reality experiences in video games, like from the margins and like how there's such a difference between the two. Like the one is focused more on, like you said, like fixing something or 
money and like being more productive and like that kind of more capitalist way of thinking. And then on the other side, it's about like community and play and imagination and creativity and all this kind of stuff. So did you say what I think about resting games or like how do you mean? Um, like the intersection between rest and play. Like where play becomes restful, um, especially for neurodivergent people. So like in burnout, like there are different kind of like, I guess degrees mm -hmm. of rest that I've noticed, right? That sometimes you need full rest, doing nothing, staring blankly into space versus a little more um, intellectual engagement with the things that you like. Uh, or just playing solitaire for hours. Yeah, yeah, I got you. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, um, <laughs> Um, <laughs> yeah, no, there is definitely a thing and there is a thing in repetition, right, that is sometimes soothing and like self-soothing, soothing especially. And I think there is a huge space in that. That's also what I mean when I say kind of like there are games that work for neurodivergent people and there are also games that work for everyone and just work a little bit different for neurodivergent people. That all is out there, but we're looking at generalized what is are the game experiences that people make without making a difference between different embodiments. And when we look at specific embodiments, we don't look at kind of like these ordinary experiences. And that's kind of like the gap that I see there. But definitely, yeah, there is, um, there is a moment of, of rest in that. I tend to like to refer to in that context also to uh, media studies. Um, I had a professor uh, who wrote this book about the TV show, uh, Trash TV, the TV show I love to hate. It's a collection. I'm not sure whether it's in German right now. But yeah, cozy games. Yeah, exactly. That's how they feel. Um, they also change for me all the time. But anyway, um, so TV trash. and. Um, he pointed out that it is so important to have like low engagement, um, kind of like cognitively low engaging TV shows because like you come home from work and sometimes you just kind of like wanna, wanna you know, not be engaged but like have kind of like a background noise hanging. And this is how I just recently watched all of the seasons of Desperate Housewives. Horrible show. Don't watch it. But like you know, like yeah, you you kind of like need all these things as well sometimes where you know, yeah, you you have kind of a background, just like, you know, soothing thing. By the way, I watch these shows, like Desperate Housewives, to have like an easy point of critique, because that is my happy place. <laughs> it's so weird. Where I'm like, you know, this is wrong, and I know exactly why. It's very easy to critique, and I love that. But that is also why I cannot recommend it. There is a brief questionnaire from the organizers to gather quick feedback about the events in the chat. Okay, Johan is next. Um, just unmute yourself and ask the question. Johan is from my lab, from my XE lab, and he does some really cool VR work. <laughs> <laughs> Did you understand the German? Uh, very vaguely. I'm. Uh, I speak Afrikaans. I so I'm more. Cl I'm closer to Dutch than uh, than German. Um, but yeah, uh, really, really cool talk. Um. I want to ask, so for background, um, a lot of my research is, my thesis is about making VR more accessible by creating techniques that allow people to kind of use their existing accessible input devices rather than, you know, potentially inaccessible VR controllers. Um, as of right now, one of the biggest challenges I'm experiencing is designing a study that demonstrates that the techniques I'm building are actually making a difference in these communities. Um, traditional HCI kind of paper structure or thinking logic always seems to revolve around this thought process of like, we made this X percent fast faster, um, you know, faster or more accurate, all these things, or some other like these like kind of pure performance metrics. My question is like, what's the role that these kind of objective measures need to take in accessible HCI work? Or should we focus more on this kind of zero to one problem of VR is widely inaccessible for many people? Here's at least one way to do it. That depends on what you're interested in ultimately, right? Um, uh, independent of what the field of HCI might be interested in. That's the first thing. But, you know, I feel like you have one of those studies where you can just like, you know, easily do one that really focuses on the qualitative differences that makes and just do observations. What do people even say? How do they engage with things? Like, you know, qualitatively describe that because first of all, that seems to be a driver behind your motivation if I am not assuming too much. <laughs> but also second of all, like um, that is also the difference you want to make and that you want to describe, no? And so, yeah, just do that. 
I'm not. I know. No, I just know. I know. Um, I'm not sure whether he's round. I know that Leonard goes around and says, like, you know, you should kind of like, you know, um, put, um, make sure that you're always very much in tune with with kind of like the publication venue that you are targeting. And I am very much preaching almost the opposite. Um, oh yeah, he's not from Leonard's lab. Is Dan Vogel? Um, <laughs> so yeah, so um, our prof is pretty much like yeah. Whatever, whatever will make you happy. Let's go for that. But Johan and I, I know had a Dan. Lot of yeah, this, yeah. We we had a lot of discussions together, and as someone who is like newly, I'm new to the uh, disability uh, community in general, and still coming to terms with my physical disability and you know the neurodivergent side of it. Um, what I was telling Johan is that I feel like the world makes disabled people feel so bad um, at the smallest things that you do every day. And so sometimes maybe if it's not quick, but it makes me feel great because I get access to this and and that like makes me enjoy my life. As a disabled person, I'm like, that is a more interesting metric in my biased opinion. <laughs> Uh, then how quickly I can do it, because sometimes I don't even want to be quick about it. I want to enjoy this thing that I could never do before. So. Yeah, you might be uh, someone who is really into a concept of crypt time. Yeah, totally. It's it's I'm totally into it. Um, I think uh, we have a, a question in the chat. Um, oh, oh, two even. Yeah, one is for you. Crypt time, baby. Talking about uh, looking for guidelines on VR made by indigenous researchers and creators. Cool, you guys can keep chatting on the chat about this. Um, and Danielle, uh, she said, first of all, thank you for the talk. I wonder which ways do you see that games could improve in being accommodating to the needs of neurodiverse individuals? Well, so pet peeve of mine. I differentiate between neurodivergent and neurotypical. I know this is not a clear, a clear binary, so sometimes I also, if I give myself the time, I tend to say neurotypically presenting, um, but uh, uh, to kind of like leave that space in there. But uh, I, uh, no single person, no individual can be diverse. That doesn't make sense. It's a group characteristic because diversity is made up of like, you know, differently diverse individuals who are all different, but like as a single person, you can't be different from yourself. It's a logical thing. Pet peeve, super pet peeve. <laughs> yep. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, sure. Um, uh, I can see games being accommodating to uh, different things. You know, one of the most accessible games to me I have recently played was, uh, Okay, well, how's it called? Save the Light or something? It's, it's a Steven Universe game. It's wholesome. It is, you know, challenging at some times. And, you know, also easy. And I played it when I had COVID again. Oh, actually, I played it when I couldn't give this talk. Yeah. Um, it was it was very great. And, like, uh, I sometimes um, feel like this is kind of like, it doesn't always need to be, like, you know, I, I'm not necessarily a person who thinks like, you know, everybody has to play, and I have played Assassin's Creed, it's fine. Um, but like, you know, it's not necessarily that everybody needs to want to have the same access to the same types of games. Different people have different things they want to have. And some games are already more conducive to specific types of play than others. Um, I'm going to ask a, a follow-up question to this. I think um, there's also one already in the chat that is kind of like, you know, following yeah, up on that. And we have someone that raised their hand. So in your oh. perspective, have you heard of Hades, the Hades game, and how they made oh, yeah. the God mode as the accessibility mode? Um, it's lovely. I'm at 80% God mode. <laughs> exactly. Like, that was one of the accessibility uh, options that it's true, truly accessible, not necessarily for disabled people, but also uh, for people who don't like to be stressed, stressed out and stuff like that. So you feel like that's a good take on uh, making accessibility role in a game, for example? 
I honestly, I love that one because first of all, I talked about dungeon crawlers briefly, and that would have been such a better example because like that one really, really is that game that kind of like plays with that so much because you don't get instant guard mode. You still have to go through those failures, but you get that clear path of like when it's going to be more, you know, easier because like you get 2% more guard mode every time you fail. And so your failure is rewarded. And that's what I want to see. No, um, like this is just very personal in that regard, but I have so many hours on Hades. Um, we have been playing Thanks. Hades in this a lot. Um, can't wait. Like I, I also love all the super giant games, but you know, yeah, no, Hades did, did it in a fantastic way, at least on that regard. I'm not sure how accessible it is on other regards. And I find the graphics sometimes a little bit much, to be fair, a bit yeah. overwhelming. Um, but also it doesn't have to work at every moment or like, you know, in every context. So, yeah. yeah. There so was a question Lena um, asked and here, others. are there any books or other sources you could recommend if we want to learn more about accessibility and design? There's lots. Um, since you are very close to the United States of America, um, there is Accessibility in uh, Accessible America, which is a recent book by, um, uh, oh God, name starts with B, but like the title is Accessible America, you'll find it. Um, and then uh, there is Amy Hamraya's work uh, there. I do want to say, just, I'm not, uh, well, the thing is also like, are you asking accessibility or are you asking access, right? There are like different kinds, thank you, Kaylee. There are different kinds of principles behind that. But, um, so Amy Hamraya wrote about, um, wrote, uh, that book is uh, called Universal Access, I think. Um, the reason why, I also encourage you to just look into disability culture um, uh, uh, context. Like there is the Disability Visibility Anth Anthology um, for new in neurodiver oh, building access, that's how it's called. Yeah, thanks. Um, the one by Amy Amrai. Um, there is uh, also um, from, from kind of like an artistic uh, perspective on the weight of our dreams. There is uh, other books that I like in that context. Of course, Leah um, Lakshmi's uh, uh, Disability Justice book. There is uh, Disability Kinship. Um, things. I'm struggling right now to find something that is not from the US, which is a bit sad um, at the top of my head. Um, oh, wait, there is Jane Gollop's work. Um, there's also, uh, uh, um, like, we're, we're going more into disability studies now, but like, you know, Susan Wendell's work on, um, uh, on who is Canadian, but you know that, you have a list I've been told. Um, my partner's Canadian, they told me that. Um, and uh, there's a list of Canadian people that Canadian people apparently know. <laughs> anyway, so Susan Wendell, um, there is uh, from the UK, Jenny Morris, who also talks about kind of like that rights-based um, stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, you got stuff to read now. I guess Eli Clare, Eli Clare is brilliant in perfection. It's just such a great book that will mean things to you. And if you're, you know, queer as well, there is also Exile and Pride. Um, and then there's McGraw's Script Theory. But now there's just like, I'm just telling you all my favorite books, so it doesn't matter anymore. It's not specifically to accessibility and design, but I feel if you read stuff by and from disabled people, you are also getting, getting kind of like notions of access, kind of like through that. Thank yeah, you. I actually, I actually thing. got a book, and I don't know if you ever read it, but um, it was it was someone told me that I should get, and it's called How to Be Sick, um, and it's kind of like um, really good for not only for people who are disabled, but also uh, their caretakers uh, and people who struggle with the fact that you're not gonna get better. Like this, this is your life now, especially if you weren't disabled before. Um, and that's a that's a really good one. But that is not about disability or design or anything like that. It's about understanding disabled people. And I think uh, I agree totally with Kata here is understanding them, their experiences, their barriers, uh, their heartaches, their happinesses. Um, that's the best path to be able to design something meaningful and truly enjoyable to them. Um, 
we have another person with a hand up. Hannah, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, thank you. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, good. Uh, so uh, I'm actually just starting in this field about the researching about the game and disability and uh, as someone who came from the health professional, actually when I said I want to research about games and disability and they will like expect me to do something about the uh, game as a therapy tools, which is actually not what I want to do. Uh, so. I want to be more like on the experience, like playing games as their daily life, like every other people do. So I want these games to be part of the disabled people. I want them to be, uh, I want them to have an access like everyone else have an access to it. But you know, uh, as my surrounding is very medical oriented, they expect me to link this to a, a therapy, therapeutic function as a therapy tools. So do you have some uh, word that can enlighten me to, you know, present this kind of idea or any kind of intersection about this? Well, <laughs> the thing is like, uh, I, uh, I mean, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to tout my own horn here and I'm going to say, I wrote this paper that, you know, um, kind of argued that Within neuro, um, uh, the purpose of playing is how it's called. There we go. That's a link. Um, um, we wrote how how it kind of like you know there is a dominance at least of, of therapeutic and diagnostic approaches in, in that. Um, okay context missing but like there is a there is an uh, a dominance of therapeutic and kind of like diagnostic approaches when it comes to play and, and neurodivergence and dis specifically in this context um and you could just argue that there is a research gap that you know is still relevant to where it's kind of like a consideration of health because we need to look at health from like you know different perspectives of embodiment as well because different bodies can be differently healthy or like you know we just talked about how to be sick kind of like, you know, difficult in that context of what we understand as that, but like, you know, how to support different people in like having like positive experiences or all that. And you might want to spin it in around that kind of like as that as a research gap as well, if you want to kind of reject that a bit. Yeah, exactly. I think it also um, brings, it brings to the forefront, Kata, that we are always being like, uh, society is always trying to treat disabled people, diagnose them, um, mm. rehabilitate them, instead of also looking at the the entertainment need that able-bodied people have tons of entertainment out there. And so disabled people do deserve in, like entertainment that is made for them too. And it might have some uh, therapeutic mental health or whatever benefits as a result of that. Um, probably will have, but it doesn't have to be built with that purpose. You know what I mean? I mean, th that's the thing, right? I'm not against therapies as such. I'm not against um, medical advances. I'm not even against diagnosis. Heck, when I was diagnosed with things, it has always been like such a revelation and like such a way of finding things out. And there are conditions of my environment that I have not been diagnosed for 20 years now. And it's like, you know, really difficult to live with. Like, I totally get that as an important part of things that need to be done. I just feel it's weird that it's the only thing that is done. Whereas, you know, games and play research has fought so hard to be accepted as, you know, valid. And then why should it only be accepted and valid for specific types of embodiments? That is just a question that we need to also ask, I think. And then there was like the thing about, yeah, uh, Mara wrote, they can't remember what the paper was called, but it came to the conclusion that people don't really like to play games they're forced to play, ha ha. And fun thing is, so kids define work as things you have to do and play as things you get to do. And it is very weird to me that in a disabled context, games are often something that you have to do and that takes out all the play of them. 
Um, we have more questions. So, Alize, sorry if I said it wrong. Um, uh, they're asking, hey, thank you for the great talk. I was wondering, uh, what do you think is the biggest challenge when it comes to taking uh, the perspectives of people with disability in VR? Also, when it comes to representation of disability in VR, there are mixed opinions about whether people want representation or not. Um, what do you think is a good way to navigate around these differences when making these decisions? Yeah, we have that kind of tendency in design to make decisions that are essentially like, you know, an answer to things. And, you know, disabled people are diverse also in how they engage with their disability. And, you know, um, <laughs> um, I, I, so, uh, I wanted to say I have several disabilities and so like, you know, to some I have a different relationship than to others. Um, yeah, but it's also like, you know, uh, I, uh, most of them I have realized either late in life, or, um, like uh, I got um, diagnosed with uh, ADHD as an adult and um, or have uh, acquired, as you might want to say. Um, but um, or have like kind of like come up later. And so um, I, I have a very different experience when it comes to that, to, to some of them. And like, I feel it's important that we acknowledge that different people have kind of like different levels of experience with that too. So um, again, within the deaf community, my current special interest is in sign language. And so I do study to become an interpreter on the side. So excuse me for that example all the time. But um, so, the, within the deaf communities, you have people who are like, you know, strongly on the on the thing of like, this is not a disability, it's a cultural difference. We just use a different language and all that. Um, and then there are people who are like, but you know, we are being disabled because the world is so oriented on hearing capabilities, and because we're not we're a minority body in that context. Elizabeth Barnes, if you want to read that, um, uh, the minority body. Uh, if you also not U.S. Ha, getting there. Yeah, that we don't need to make like that one decision. People contain multitudes, especially in groups, and um, and it's fine to make like you know one informed decision or another, or you know allow for both. Like make things flexible. Kind of like I don't think there's like one answer. There is also like what is the biggest challenge when it comes to taking the perspectives of people with disability in VR? I guess that you know some people, if I may be so bold and provocative, think the biggest challenge is people who don't identify as disabled and maybe also aren't that much in their everyday life, um, kind of, you know, dismiss the perspectives of pe disabled people, not because they want to, often they feel like, you know, they're taking them in and trying to be empathetic, but exactly that kind of empathy stands in the way because they're centering their own understanding of other people's experiences instead of their experiences. Um, and I think that's the biggest, you know, hurdle. I guess. Yeah, don't this assume that a wheel bound chair person wants to walk. Go and talk to wheel bound, you know, chair people. Like don't don't assume anything. Talk to them. Listen to them and believe them. Because if you don't believe them when when they tell you what they mean, what they want, what hurts them, what gives them happiness, then you can't design for them successfully. And to be fair, most of them don't understand themselves as wheelchair bound, but mostly as like, you know, using a wheelchair. I know you can take that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I we've do. just I met, do. by the way. It's like not that we've known each other <laughs> forever or whatever. Absolutely. Uh, there is no problem. I am happy to be corrected. And as I said in the beginning, there are certain things we do because we're expected to do. But before I do them, I also acknowledge my lack of knowledge in certain parts of things so people can come to me and correct me because I'd rather not keep making the same mistakes, right? <laughs> also, like just um, in, in the intersectionality of all things. No, it's not actually. Yeah. Anyway, uh, multitudes of dimensions very gracefully solved with being corrected on my pronouns. I really like that. Just going to say that as well. But then I was also thinking, oh, Canada does that really well. <laughs> I am Brazilian, though, and I'm new to Canada. So I've but been the culture everywhere. There. Mm. When it comes mm. to multiple genders. That's oh, just yeah. my thing of saying I miss y'all. 
a little. Ah, oh, just text. come over then. <laughs> don't 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 waste time missing us. Come over. <laughs> <laughs> I might for a few days in uh, summer. Nice. Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Is there anything else that you would like to tell us that wasn't in your uh, presentation and that no one asked you and you're like, ah, oh, just after having all this chat, I remember this thing that I've seen and it's good, it's meaningful. Not to put you on the spot, but also do it. <laughs> that kind of puts me on the spot. So I'm just going to say, like, if you all have any other like questions or things you want to discuss or whatever, um, I have learned that I have to say that explicitly. But I do think I am fairly approachable. You can write me an email. I will try to answer it within a specific time frame that I'm not going to tell you to not raise expectations. But, you know, I... Um, <laughs> Danielle is suffering. Um, um, but, uh, um, yeah, ultimately I, uh, I do kind of like at least try to be very approachable and like, I'm happy to talk with people about interesting things. And since I'm easily excitable, I will probably find your stuff interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, anybody else has anything else to say? No. So I guess, um, we are done for today. Uh, there is the form. Please uh, let us know how this went. Um, we really want your opinions, your perspectives, um, what we could do better and uh, what we could do differently. Uh, it really matters to us. Um, and uh, yeah, be as ruthless as you want. We want to just make more space and make it better. Thank you so much, Kata. Uh, sorry about my mistakes. I'm learning, but we're on it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you bye so much, bye. Kata. Thanks, Kata. Yeah, thank you all for inviting me and being gracious with, like, you know, me sleeping 20 hours a day because I had COVID. It wasn't in no state to do this in any kind of entertaining way. I might have just fallen asleep.